a business owner is the risk owner for the business. You own that risk. If the company fails, if the um, if the company gets compromised by a hacker, like you definitely want to point your finger at someone else. You don't want it to be your fault because you say, well, I've hired you know, this internal IT person to take care of it. I've hired this MSP to take care of it. But you you know that you can't abdicate uh -huh. in your business. You can delegate, but you still own all that risk. So you uh -huh. want to be sure that the things people tell you are happening are actually happening and not find out after the fact. And some organizations just did not take it seriously. So they never implemented all of them. Uh, and it's because of that, like the government didn't just make this a regulation because, you know, for shits and giggles, you know, they wanted to protect their information. And if you are not implementing those controls, you are not sufficiently protecting their information. So they came up with an accountability program uh, that requires certification and official attestation. And that is CMMC. Welcome to another episode of CSA's Collab Space. My name is Amy Cisse. Today I'm here with Leia Shilobad, the founder and chief security officer, Princess of Power of Compliancy IT. Leia, thank you so much for joining me today. It is my absolute pleasure. So we met at a conference. We had an amazing conversation. So first and foremost, can you provide an introduction of who you are? Absolutely. So uh, I founded my company um, back then. We were called uh, Intech Solutions. I founded us in uh, 2006, uh, just as a regular managed services provider, with, but with a security focus. Um, when I learned about IT, it was definitely like through the lens of security, not just the lens of how you fix things. And when you learn that, you can't unsee it. You know, that's the way that you walk around all the time. Um, so when my, uh, a lot of our manufacturing clients were telling us, um, oh, there's this NIST thing because we're in the defense supply chain and we have to do this NIST thing. And I was like, oh, all right. Well, I guess I need to figure out what the NIST thing is. And I found out that they had requi compliance requirements to implement the NIST 800-171 controls because they have special government information that is sensitive. Um, and so we recognized we had to build uh, compliance programs so that they could continue to operate and have their contracts. And then I fell in love with cybersecurity compliance and really finding out ways to make that valuable for companies. Um, and last year we rebranded to Compliance CIT so that the name of our company could better reflect what it is that we do. We do Compliant IT. Nice. And so when it, as it relates to the NIST controls, so you're helping people help them to get a level of certification. Is this related to CMMI, CMMC, one of those maturity models? Yeah. So that's a good question. Um, so the companies that we do help companies with who have other types of compliance, um, you know, like companies who, uh, hold protected health information or um, and then need HIPAA or uh, need FTC safeguards uh, alignment because they have sensitive customer data. Um, but uh, the bulk of the work that we're doing right now is with uh, defense contractors who have federal contract information or controlled and classified information and need to implement the 800-171 controls so that they can comply with CMMC, which is the cybersecurity model, um, maturity model certification. Um, that actually is not currently a live rule that is um, set to go as a final rule and be a requirement for certification uh, end of this year, beginning of next year. But it's a big lift, so we are working on it now. <laughs> So, and they're switching, right? They're switching it from self-certification to um, another process. Is that why, is that where the rule is changing? Yeah, so um, when the requirement came out to implement those controls, um, I think it was back in like uh, 2016, 
maybe in 20, end of 2015. And the DOD gave everybody 18 months to implement the controls. So by December uh, 31st of 2017, which was some time ago, um, everybody was supposed to implement all these controls and then self-attest and say, yes, I've done it. And then the, the DOD's assessment body um, at, at a DCMA, which is called the DIBCAC, welcome to the government and a whole wide world of acronyms. Um, so they, they went around to specific, um, you know, projects uh, and contracts to check, you know, did, did they implement it if they said that they did? And they found that there was a 100% fail rate of the implementation of those controls. So no one implemented them properly. Some organizations thought that they did. They thought they were like, they really in good faith thought they did. And they just simply didn't understand. Um, and so they, that's why they failed. And some organizations just did not take it seriously. And so they never implemented all of them. Uh, and it's because of that, like the government didn't just make this a regulation because, you know, for shits and giggles, you know, they wanted to protect their information. And if you are not implementing those controls, you are not sufficiently protecting their information. So they came up with an accountability program uh, that requires certification and official attestation. And that is CMMC. And so this is, you mentioned defense contractors. Do you feel like this is going to trickle down to the civilian agency contractors as well? Oh, absolutely. Um, in some form. So uh, the, the, at the federal level across all agencies, there is a rule that's going through that um, there'll be requirements like this to protect uh, the CUI, controlled and classified information across all agencies. And that is going to make all these agencies have some sort of program. Now they can choose, it can look whatever, like whatever they want it to, right? They don't have to copy paste. However, the DOD has been doing this now for so many years and they put so much effort into it and the other agencies have been watching this. So it's highly likely that it will be a, ah, you know, let's look at your homework and, you know, copy that over here so that we can have a similar kind of program. So whether it looks very similar, exactly the same, um, or a close approximation, this is going to be trickling down to all of the other agencies. Do you feel like the prime should be worried about this? Or do you feel like the subcontractors should also take this seriously and prepare for this change? Um, if, um, if you are a federal contractor um, with any agency at all, not just DOD, you should be getting some clarity about the kind of information that you currently hold or produce. Um, if they're a federal contractor, then they definitely have federal contract information. And it's already a requirement for all federal agencies to protect that federal contract information, which is just not the, it's not just the contract itself. It could potentially be email communication back and forth about, um, about that contract. It could be POs and invoices. Um, the requirement to protect that is, is not super hard, but you want to make sure you're doing the right thing and you're thinking about where is my federal contract information and then figuring out, is it, do I have CUI? Do I have controlled and classified information? If you are anywhere in that supply chain working on a federal contract across all agencies and be prepared for it. Um, the defense contractors have been working on this for literally years, years. And so it has been a big effort to understand the controls, to figure out what information they have that has to be protected. What's the data flow? Who has access to it, needs access to it? How do we protect it? Um, and all, there's a lot of documentation that is also required to support what you're doing. You can't just be like, oh yeah, we do that. I mean, you're like, okay, show me the policy that, you know, show me the list, show me the the standard operating procedure, show me the baseline configuration. If you can't say yes to that, then, then you haven't uh, implemented the controls properly. And is it is it likely that, um, that those programs will be self-attestation where they have to log into a federal portal and just say, yes, I'm doing this, I'm attesting under law that I'm doing this, um, or will they have a similar certification process we don't, we don't know yet. We don't know what each agency gets to choose what they want to do. 
but you need to be prepared because you can't just, if there's no teeth in it of an assessment, you still can't just say, you know, oh, it's not that important. I mean, it's, it's law. It is uh, in your contracts. You have a contractual obligation and um, we have a, you know, a, a program called the False Claims Act and that applies to all federal agencies. So if you take essentially taxpayer dollars, that's, I mean, that, that's all the federal government has, right, is our money. They don't have any money of their own. <laughs> so if you take our money, taxpayer dollars, to perform on a contract and you don't do what they sit you signing, yes, I'm going to do all these things. And included in that is protecting the CUI with a 171 controls. So you don't do that. They're like, ah, oh, nothing's going to happen. Well, um, the False Claims Act is the teeth, right? So if you decide not to do that, anyone in your company can whistleblow you. Um, you can't, you know, there's no retribution that can come back on them. And they can get thousands or tens of thousands of dollars in a paycheck for the whistleblowing. And you can get tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars of fines for not following what it says in that contract. And you don't want that, right? That, that is just too risky for a business. Oh yeah, absolutely. Do you see there that, that there are common themes where companies are not implementing for like the common reasons? Do you feel like it's simply lack of knowledge? Do you think that they're just distracted? Do you think that they don't know how to implement? Do you think the lines are blurred of what they need to accomplish? I, to be I think it's, I think it's multidimensional. I think. Um, one of the problems is that it is a heavy lift. And if you don't have um, a structured approach for how you're going to implement it, it can just feel like a lot. And you, know, you think, well, where do I even start here? Or, that's definitely part of it. Part of it is certainly the cost because there are different security tools that you have to implement in order to make those uh, meet those controls. And there's a price tag to those. Also, if you work with a managed services provider to help you with your IT, those costs are going to go up because we have to raise up to a higher standard, right? We need to level up our game to a higher standard of our systems, our processes, our documentation. So the cost is going to go up there. Um, maybe you have to even change some business processes and that's expensive or upgrade your technology. And if you have to upgrade your ERP because it's not compliant, that can be a several hundred thousand dollar price tag. So um, costs are a huge thing of people not implementing. And then, of course, there is a, a concern with when you read the control, you know, NIST has its own language. And um, if you speak NIST, you know exactly what they mean. But if you're just a technician and you read a control, you're like, uh, well, what exactly does this mean? You know, like, are they talking about this over here? Are they talking about this? Um, and you want to do the right thing and maybe get paralyzed with your analysis. And so you're not sure what to move forward, how to move forward, or who do you ask? You know, that's, um, we're very lucky in the CMMC ecosystem. I don't really particularly care for that word, but that's what we're using, the ecosystem. Um, there are a lot of very, very knowledgeable people who um, are very open to share freely to help, um, and um, which is one of the th reasons I love this community that we're in, because everybody just wants us to be successful. Uh, well, I want defense contractors to be successful in this and, and retain contracts. And now even my company, because we manage companies in the defense industrial base, my company has to get compliant and certified now too. So I'm in the trenches with everyone else, getting ourselves certified, ready for certification. Yeah, I mean, that it makes a ton of sense where you have to kind of, like you mentioned, level up to be able to provide that expert advice. But at the end of the day, you're providing it to all your different customers. So you already have your, your boilerplate template and you know exactly what they need according to their actual um, configurations and how they work. So, you know, even though it's like, yeah, I have to pay a bit more to hire this company at the end of the day, 
if you try to figure it out yourself, then you're probably going to not go down the right road and you could probably get them finished faster versus yeah, and, hiring a company. That yeah, I agree with that. I absolutely agree with that. But, um, you know, I'm a business owner, too. So if I have to do like this massive effort, I I want some justification or some payout besides I just get to keep my contracts. And um, and there is. So if you really implement CMMC appropriately, then you are implementing a robust cybersecurity compliance program for your organization. And then you have structure for a cadence of activities that happen all the time, checks to make sure that uh, maintenance is happening, that um, the environment is still standardized and aligned. Um, risk management, like actually getting together I'm providing a report to say, we checked, we ran these tools, we checked all these things. Here are the things that are out of alignment. We've already created tickets for those. We're closing those out. Here's some risks to your business or some security advisories that are happening right now. We need you to know about, um, is your training and awareness plan up to date? Um, you know, like we, you have a structured program like that where you know when you're doing these things. Uh, because usually we all think those things are important, but in our day to day, when we're putting out fires, we defer, we defer, we defer. We're like, I'm going to get to that. And then it's been a year and there's lots of important things you never do. When you're on that program, you know, you're meeting once a quarter and all the activities you're doing coming up to that meeting to prepare for it, to realign the environment, update the documentation, to make sure everyone's doing what they're supposed to do. Um, and then you have this higher level of confidence that your environment is secure. And you also have, if you are not a technical person, you have this uh, this vision into this stuff. Like, are we like the, they're always asking me, like, oh, am I secure? Like, no, like nobody's 100 percent secure. You know, are we mitigating your risks? Yeah. And this is how. But you're never you're never like secure. You've not arrived, you know, at, at security, you know. Yes, you're secured. Nobody breathe and no one touch the computers. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> ever again. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, the, uh, you get so much value out of that because, um, you know, you a, a business owner is the risk owner for the business. You own that risk. If the company fails, if the um, if the company gets compromised by a hacker like you definitely want to point your finger at someone else you don't want it to be your fault because you say well i've hired you know this internal it person to take care of it i've hired this msp to take care of it but you you know that you can't abdicate mm -hmm. in your business you can delegate but you still own all that risk so you mm -hmm. want to be sure that the things people tell you are happening are actually happening and not find out after the fact that's true. Very, very true. Because at the end of the day, your tax returns, <laughs> they're your obligation, regardless who prepared it, regardless of what data you gave to your accounting company, or if you decided to do it yourself. <laughs> That's right. 100%. Yes. yes. And so what kind of compliance solutions do you offer? Um, so we actually, uh, because we had to help so many different companies get compliant, and they're looking to us to assist them with managing it. Uh, we created a um, kind of like a how to implement um, and maintain cybersecurity compliance programs that we call the IT documentation toolkit. Because after I authored it, I um, uh, was out of any energy and creativity to come up with a sexy name. Uh, so I just called it what it is. <laughs> Um, it has not only the templates in it, but basically like, here's how, here's all the things you're going to do every quarter. Here's the report up, you know, here's the people who should be part of this program. Um, and, uh, and so we, we actually license that to organizations who just want to take it and build their own thing. Um, we also help um, companies to implement that program and maintain it over time. Uh, and, uh, and then of course we offer uh, compliant infrastructure services and compliant help desk services in addition to um, different security tool sets to help you to uh, meet those control requirements and, uh, and make you secure, as secure as you can be. As possible, <laughs> exactly. 
So does your toolkit, do you work with um, data or is it more like you mentioned, like the infrastructure or in the help desk pieces? Like yeah. are there various components? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the toolkit is not a, um, like it's not a, a SaaS application or a platform. Mm -hmm. Um, it basically is like, you know, because this is this is something I highly recommend the use of a GRC tool, governance risk and uh, compliance tool that you load, like whatever your regulatory compliance is load it in there and then use that SaaS application to actually track your alignment with those controls and that compliance requirement. Um, but all of your documents, like your IT security policies, your information sensitivity and flow plan. Um, your BCDR plan, like all of those kinds of things are going to live on your corporate systems and they need to be in a, in a format that is universal. So those things are all in Word documents so that, um, that they can live on your corporate systems and be accessible. Um, and, you know, all of our sample procedures and, and things of that nature, some of them are IT and some of them uh, deal with physical security or information security. Those are also in native word format so that, you know, wherever it is that you store that kind of information, you know, whether you have a SaaS application that has all that in it, or it's just on SharePoint or Google Workspace, you can easily put it in there and modify it so that the people that have to use it, it's easily accessible to them. Nice. So it sounds like you're helping them with their structure, their processes, mm -hmm. making sure they're in alignment so that they're not doing these hodgepodge one-off type of activities. Yeah. And that, that to me, that was um, like, I like to simplify things as much as possible and make them as functional as possible. You know, I tell my people, my guys in my organization, I'm like, we have standard operating procedures and my expectation is that you follow them, but you also have agency to suggest a better way because um, I want things to be as functional as possible. In other words, like, don't just do a thing to do it because it's on the piece of paper, or I said to, do it because it makes sense. And mm -hmm. so implementing this stuff across like, you know, dozens of clients over the years, and then also watching um, my other colleagues who license it and implement it with their clients, giving us feedback, like, how do we make this better? How do we make this more effective? So these environments, you know, um, here's a here's a good example of of uh, of how an environment can become misaligned. This happens frequently. Uh, a technician is troubleshooting a particular issue, so they create a test account. That happens a lot, right? You don't want to bother a particular user. Create a test account. Well, well, they're so excited that they fixed the issue, they forgot to go back and delete that test account, right? So it just sits there forever until maybe somebody logs into Azure or into um, you know, Active Directory and they're like, WTF, like where the hell did this come from? Who did this? Um, and that can be there for a very long time. Uh, another example is um, somebody having access to information that they're not supposed to have access to. Uh, maybe they were granted access to a share that has sensitive information, whether it's government information or intellectual property, and they weren't supposed to have access to it. You know, this process is checking things like that over the course of the year. Um, and then you can say, yes, these people are supposed to have access to that I, I'm as their manager. Yes, because IT doesn't know. You're the one that tells your IT person, right? So one time we did this alignment and we're like, oh, we found this test account. We wanted to let you know we created a ticket, deleted it because we're doing that alignment every quarter. One time. We're sitting there with management and said, okay, here's the list of all the users and these ones have access to CUI. Oh, no, from the owner of the company. This guy's not supposed to have access to CUI. How did he get access to CUI? And I'm just like, oh crap, because like we manage the environment. So I go back, <laughs> I go back and pull the ticket and I look at our change management system and I say, oh, well, when he was created as a new user, the general manager, said, well, we want him to have the same permissions as Bob. And so my team created the new user and gave him the same permissions as Bob. But Bob has access to CUI. Like uh -huh. your IT people will not know what a new user is supposed to have access to, only you. They just follow your orders if you're the one that's supposed to tell them, right? 
So that gave us the opportunity to catch something like right this an out of, uh, out of compliance, misalignment, not information they were supposed to have access to. If you don't have a process like that, like that could have gone on for months or years and nobody would have known if you don't have some kind of mechanism to check on these things and to verify with the people that have the information to say, yes, they're supposed to have access to this information. Yes, they're allowed to use those jump drives. Like we just do what you tell us to. <laughs> that is so very important because, because we work with data that lives in Office 3, Microsoft 365 now, <laughs> because we work with data all the time, you're mm -hmm. absolutely right where someone's going to say, why does this person have access to something that they should not have access to? Yep. And I feel like lately, like over the years, it's been more and more instances of that yes. where yes. people are, right, like they have to actually, as content owners, right? Like, I think sometimes to your point, people in the organization don't realize that they actually own that data. They maintain that data. I mean, they don't own it per se because it's the government's data or it's the agency's data. It's the law firm's data. But if you are the person that's supposed to maintain that data and keep it up to date, and, and like you said, make sure that you know that you're responsible for that data, Mm -hmm. and your duties to protecting that data, then you have to make sure that you're reviewing who has access. So very important. And you're absolutely right. If some random person who's not the owner, but they're a member of that content and they just submit a help desk ticket and say, oh, such and such needs access, like Bob, IT is going to say, oh, check, done, access granted. And it's so important to be diligent to make sure that, like you said, test accounts. So our team <laughs> also, right, we created a process as well. When you grant yourself access to something, when you're done with that test, you have to remove yourself. Mm -hmm. Because when we had to go and do an audit, and when you think about the way that SharePoint works, with now the team has a SharePoint site and a group has a SharePoint site. And now there's all these different sites. You have to, when you do, when we went to do an audit, there's all these IT people that live in all these different sites now because they went in to do something. So if you have like a big IT team, uh, maybe, I don't know, 30, 40, 100 people that's doing IT services, those are a lot of different instances where they can have access to something where they probably don't need access anymore. And I think that that also gives risk to that IT person, right? Because yeah. they could have seen some information that they probably shouldn't have seen. Yeah. And and the the check and bat, like the, the, the standard and the process is huge because you have to be very clear with your team on what you expect and from that perspective. But going back and checking from time to time is so important because like we have this expectation. I've trained you. Here's the standard. I expect you to do it. But sometimes you have a team member who's not aligned. Right. And you're not going to know um, for some time unless you're checking back in envir environments. And then if you see a pattern with a particular team member that they're not following this process, they're not aligned that way, They that that's a sign to us, to you and me, that that person is too big of a risk for our, for our company to work on any environment and they need to not be at our company anymore. But if sometimes like if you're not going back and, and checking that alignment, that can go by for a very long time because those people also cover really well and present mm -hmm. really well. And so you think they're doing what they're supposed to be doing so if you're not, if you're not like, you know, like, oh, look at all these test accounts. Oh, low well, audit logs. Oh, <laughs> Ryan, Ryan's problematic, right? So it also pays to have that IT background where even if you're not implementing the work, you know enough to know what to check for. Yeah. Because, and, and I, and, and I, have someone else on the team do QA who didn't do the work. 
And so I just feel like you have to have like a second pair of eyes. It's mm -hmm. also for just making sure the client gets what they need. It's also making sure that if there was anything that the first person missed, because if you're dealing with massive amounts of data or highly configured solutions, then no one's going to catch everything, not one person, right? Yep. And so I do think that it's important to, um, like you said, have that accountability, mm -hmm. making sure that other someone else is checking. Yeah, um, and it's not to it's not to say that someone needs to keep tabs on you. It's just we want to make sure we're delivering a quality product. Yeah, at the end I, of the day, I find it problematic and a red flag in a team member if they don't want a QA, because mm. if you are like, um, I want my work to be tight. You want someone to check it to make yes. sure that you didn't miss something because your name is on that. Um, I, I do that with like when I when I write this documentation, even if I'm writing like a sales email, I have another set of eyes proof it for me because I think I'm a pretty damn good writer, but <laughs> I make mistakes, you know, if that and that's just like, you know, it would be hubris of me to think that like, you know, I I everything I do is perfect. So if I have a if I have a team member, like a technical team member that does not want a QA, I immediately have a red flag go up. There's something wrong here because if you have high standards, you want someone to check your work so you know 100% it's tight. Right. And if you have high standards and you know that you're doing everything you're supposed to do, QA should be a breeze. It should be, oh yeah, this person has always gotten everything done and there's nothing that needs to be changed. But red flag on red flag is that if someone does QA your work and you said, oh, everything's fine. And then oh. there's a ton of mistakes. Yeah. Oh, that Big is problem. good. Good data to have to try to figure out like what's going on here and do I want to keep them on my team? I mean, I'm always about like, um, I so I'm not like, I say that I'm a zero trust girl, but that's not completely true. Oh. Clearly, I, clearly, I don't like mistrust everyone 100%, but I'm always walking around in my head with like, um, it's important for me to have the right um, signs, data, information so that I can maintain that level of trust. Um, and then when something deviates out of it, like now, I'm, now I'm down at zero trust, right? Like, um, and you have to, like with what we do in IT, you have to have incredibly high trust with your team or your organization is going to go so slow that you will go out of business because you won't be able to deliver on anything. Um, so like trust is so important. Wait, you just added a human element onto the zero trust principles of tech. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> and so that is amazing, right? <laughs> I've never had someone do that um, because of course zero <laughs> trust is like, um, I always like to think of it in the simplest terms of like least privilege, mm -hmm. um, giving people the granular level of exactly what they need. And it's also saying, if you don't need access to this, you don't have access. Right. And so, but that whole add on to the zero trust of like the human element was awesome. Yeah. So. And, and without trust, um, you know, like, who was it? Was it Stephen Covey? I can't remember, but somebody said, when there's trust, um, things go faster, um, uh, are, are easier and cost less. When there's lack of trust, things are harder, more expensive, um, and go slower. And I'm not interested in those three things. That's not fun. <laughs> um, so I need high trust. Oh, yeah, especially as a business owner. Like, we don't have time. And we have to trust our teams to just run off and go do what they need to do because we can't afford to get sucked into like having to handhold people. Like it's just not, <laughs> it's not okay. Yep. Yep. So shifting gears to people aspect. So networking, why is it important? What do you enjoy out of it? How does that help you in your business? Um, so it helps me on both uh, the client acquisition side, as well as um, just being able to perform. Um, 
so I'm I'm huge about uh, having very good relationships and connections across the board with everything. You know, prospects, clients, colleagues, vendors, everybody. Because if I have a if I have a need, um, I want to be able to fill it easily. So if it's like if I'm dealing with my vendor and something I feel like with their product is going sideways, like I want someone that I can reach out to, uh, hopefully via text message. I'm kind of like, kind of, you're going to find out, like, I'm like, I want to know, I want to have the cell phone number of the owner. Like I have, this is horrible. I've got like cell phone numbers of like these like billion dollar companies, like in, in this thing right here, because I have, I'm, I have a problem like that where I want to just be like, you know, um, but, and I'm just, I'm just a dwarf company compared to them. But, um, but when you have those kind of relationships, like you can go so much faster because things just happen because you, you can get out to the right person. And, and, you know, I'm not, they don't give me their cell phone number because I'm a pain in the ass and I bother them. I provide as much value as I possibly can to them, uh, providing them with ideas or, um, you know, something of value for our relationship. Um, if it's something like um, colleagues, I love to network with my colleagues because our industry is so vast. Like if you're not in IT, you know, and you're talking to like maybe your grandparents or maybe us or parents, you know, they have this idea that anything having to do in computer land is in your 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 set of skills, right? So that would be like uh, <laughs> fixing computers, building servers, firewalls, and networking, um, troubleshooting applications, building applications, building websites. Like they think that like. It's all you, right? But we are so like, it's getting even more and more and more specific with these different areas. Um, so if if my client has a need or I have a need, like I want to be able to like know like who do I, who can I reach out to to kind of to expand my capabilities, even if it's for a short period of time, or who can I refer this person to so that they can get the right help. Um, and they see it is valuable, right? I find it very valuable because I've got people that I trust. I can just ring up the phone and say, hey, can you um, can you help me with spinning up a, um, a very complex uh, Microsoft 365 environment in GCC High? Because, you know, we probably could do it, but you do it all day long. You can do it faster than us. Um, and I have higher confidence and my team's really busy anyway. Like that's everybody wins there. You know, my team doesn't get stressed out. You get business. Client gets the the best end product, um, and uh, you know, and we can keep going fast. Um, so I, I love having uh, like a lot of really smart colleagues around me that can help me just like get stuff done. And then, um, and then I also let, love being um, a resource in my um, community, like this, my compliance community. Any companies that need compliance, because I really like helping people. You know, like I know this so well. Um, I've been doing it for a really long time. And a lot of these people are at the beginning of their journey. And I want to be able to give them ideas, resources, thoughts, direction. Um, and whether they decide to do business with me or not is kind of irrelevant. I want everyone to be successful. But oftentimes, you know, they remember that um, I, you know, I'm an influencer in the community that I can link them to all these people. So they want to keep me around. <laughs> so I, I grow my business because of that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think relationships are everything. Everything. And I just don't see why a small business would want to be the jack of all trades and a master of none. I agree <laughs> so, I yeah, agree. like just be laser focused on what you're good at. And like you said, just talk to people, meet people, and they can get it done faster. So why not just reach out to those people that are experts in their area? Yeah. And like you said, it's getting very, very, very specialized with the skill sets that people have. And to your point, when I have a family member, it doesn't happen anymore now, thank goodness. But yes, I used to have people ask me, how do I fix this computer? And my laptop, something's wrong with it. And I would look at them like, I have no clue about hardware at all. I'm bad <laughs> at hardware, actually. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I get my son to do it for my mom because he's he's 24. So I just say, you know, you 
you still enjoy that a little bit. So um, like, yeah, anytime I'm over at like my parents and they're like, my dad's like, I can't figure out how to use my Apple watch. And I'm like, Oh, <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to help you. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Do you have like a business class firewall that needs troubleshooting? <laughs> it's like, I got you there. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> He's probably looking at you like, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I do the same thing with my child. Like a new TV. Yeah. I need you to help me with that because I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah. And I like what you said. Um, everybody wins. The client wins. You're, you win. Your team is not stressed out. I love that concept. And I also love the other company also wins in that equation too because there is enough work to go around for everyone. Okay. Hundred percent, hundred percent, and that that actually dovetails with um, you know what we had talked about briefly when we were together at the conference, and that is that um, you know some people feel like and use the word competitors and like oh but are your competitors, and they have this sort of I consider a very like a scarcity mindset, um, and don't want to either collaborate or share information because they're my competitor. Well, you know, I walk around feeling like I don't really have competitors. I either feel like if we are doing this work and we are a strong ethical company, we are committed to what we're doing, we want to provide um, environments so that our customers can continue to scale and make money. We want to make sure they're secure so that they can, are not getting compromised. Um, you know, like if we're doing that, then we are all on the same team, right? And if you are a shitty company, if you have this scarcity mindset, if you're trying to keep everything for yourself, if you're not doing good work, not actually doing the stuff that's in the contract that the client signed, well, then you're not a competitor for me. You're just an asshole. Um, and, <laughs> you know, like you're not my competitor because you suck. So. <laughs> and how fast is your company going to grow with that mindset? You're just not. Exactly. Exactly. Because right. someone could expose you to an opportunity that you would never have insight into without having those relationships because you just never know who you're going to meet. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. If you if you get if you put off those vibes like you're trying to keep it all to yourself and everything close to your chest and and don't want to collaborate. Um, I mean, I give out information freely about ways that we do things, or even some of my SOPs, um, people remember that. And, it, and truly, there is, um, there is truth in that idea that whatever you put out into the universe gets revisited upon you tenfold. So you put abundance out there, abundance comes back to you. You put shit out there, tenfold shit comes back to you. <laughs> I love it. Love that <laughs> so very much. On that note, it was a pleasure having you today. <laughs> it's just some philosophy to kind of tie up the interview, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was like a mic drop. There's nothing more for her to say. <laughs> Mega, it was an absolute pleasure having you today. How can the audience get in contact with you? Um, well, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm the only Leia Shilabad there. So and actually, if you type my first name and like an S, I will come up. Um, but I'm slash Princess Leia, just like from Star Wars. Yes. Um, you can find my website. It's hard to spell. Sorry. At complianceit.io. Um, or you can just Google me. Um, and if you can't find me online, you have no business using the internet because I'm everywhere. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me today. I don't think I've lasted this much closing out an interview. Thank you for joining me. My pleasure. This was fun. Thank you.